Uh, spiritual formation is the standing human problem of how do you get good people. It isn't just a Christian issue. The Christians have an answer to it, but it's a human problem. And if you look around you, uh, even here on the campus, uh, but if you look beyond that to the world and you see so many people intent on blowing others up and you wonder where does all of this come from? And the answer is it comes from the human heart. Uh, we live in a world where malice and anger dominate human relationships. Our Congress people can't even get along with one another. Our government oozes with contempt and anger at one another so that the business of government that affects each of us deeply often doesn't get done. And so there's a real problem and I want to talk to you today specifically on the topic of how to save your life. That's a question that concerns everyone. How to save your life? Well, you say, I think I'd like to save my soul. Well, how about the rest of you? Would you like to save your body? Would you like to save your mind? After all, you, the whole person, is what salvation is concerned about. But when we start talking about salvation, often we have a very shrunken idea of being saved. Now, you all know that being saved is big business for Christians, isn't it? And someone may have asked you, are you saved? Or you may have asked someone else, are you saved? And we can begin from the question, what were you asking about when you asked that question or when that question was asked you? And in our circles, it almost always refers to one thing. And that is what's going to happen to you after you die. Are you going to heaven? Or are you going to that other place? But you know, there's another question that we need to ask ourselves. If you got into heaven, do you think you'd like it? What's it going to be like? And if your life is not caught up in God now, heaven may turn out to be unbearable. Because unless you're really close to God now, you, you, you can't miss him when you get to heaven. Someone said the other day that if you don't like worship, you don't want to go to heaven. If you do like worship, then you're probably going to spend a lot of time in it here. And it's probably going to have a lot of, uh, of effect on the kind of person you become. And that's what spiritual formation is about. Spiritual formation is the process of shaping the individual so that they love God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength. And they love their neighbor as themselves. And that's a big change, isn't it? I wonder if you've thought about how you love God with all your heart. How you love God with all your mind. How do you love God with your strength? I know some of you guys here are athletes. Can you love God with your athletic ability? And then, of course, all of you have lots of assignments. Can you love God in your assignments? We need to talk about that. I want to give you a couple of scriptures to help us think about it. And the first one is in the fifth chapter of Romans. Uh, Romans 5, of course, deals with salvation, doesn't it? And it's one of the great texts on salvation. Listen to these words from verse 8 and following. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, there's a tendency just to stop there. 
and think that's the whole deal. Christ died for us. He paid for our sins. Now we can get on with our business and we'll see him later in heaven. But keep reading. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And some of your translations, when you look at them, you'll see they've inserted the wrath of God. But the of God part isn't there. It just says we'll be saved from wrath. Well, whose wrath? Well, maybe my wrath. You ever have a problem with wrath? Towards someone? So much of the mayhem and grief that comes in our families and in our schools and in our world, uh, even in baseball and basketball and all of the sports, so much of that is our wrath. This verse is talking about being saved from our wrath. It's talking about being saved from the wrath of others. The blood of Jesus does not save us from our wrath. It does not save us from the wrath of others. But his life does. His life lived in us saves us from wrath. Just a few more words here. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, that's what I really want to hammer on you about. Because we hear so much about being saved by his death. But how are we saved by his life? Christ is alive. Let me give you a description of salvation and you try it on and see what you think, okay? Salvation is being caught up in the life that Jesus is now living on earth. Salvation is being caught up in the life that Jesus is now living. Where is he living his life? Right here. What's his relationship with his life to your life? He lives in you. Your songs all talk about that. We constantly address that issue. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We talk about becoming Christ-like and living the life that Christ would live. How do we do that? By being caught up in the life that Jesus is now living on earth. So now we want to uh, put up some of the screens and uh, talk about what this is like. So the next screen if you please. The basic idea of salvation in the Bible is deliverance. Deliverance. It isn't just deliverance from guilt, but deliverance from all kinds of things. And in the time we have we can't do a deep philosophical or biblical discussion, but if you just read your scriptures, you'll see salvation is deliverance. It applies even to the stories in the Old Testament, like you may remember a story in 1 Samuel 14, where Jonathan has a great victory. He fights a great battle. And uh, Saul, his father, who wasn't one of the brightest people to show up in the scripture, had, uh, had made a vow that if anyone ate before the sun went down, they would, any of his soldiers, had anything to eat instead of just being busy killing people, then they would be put to death. And Jonathan had had this great battle, and uh, he had found some honey, and he had dipped his sword or something in it and eaten a little honey. And Saul was going to kill him. That's, you know, not really bright. Uh, but there you are. And he was going to kill his own son because he'd eaten a little honey. And the people rose up and said, you shall not do this to, to Jonathan, who has wrought such great salvation today in Israel. I remember that story just as a way of illustrating what salvation is. Salvation is deliverance. It's deliverance from all kinds of things. It's deliverance 
by the life of Christ in us. That life enables us to be delivered from all kinds of things that could even destroy us. Now, I want to put that with another passage, and uh, you can go on to the next screen, uh, which is in Ephesians. And we get a little more information about how that works. Listen to these words from Ephesians 5, 8 and 9. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now listen to what that translates into. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. The fruit of light consists in all... How much does that leave out? You can say something. How much does that leave in all goodness? Doesn't leave out anything. All goodness. All righteousness. All truth. That's the focus of salvation. That's how your life is saved. And you have to be very careful about it because it can slip away from you. Look at verses 15 and 16. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time, your translation says, unfortunate translation, because the days are evil. Now, the old versions say redeeming the time. And it's very unfortunate that this translation is not kept because redeeming is a special kind of relation. It isn't just making the most of your time. You redeem something that has already been lost. And what Paul was aware of, and he repeats this in Colossians, your time is already out of your hands and gone if you don't become proactive and pull it back. Just the dead drag of life can defeat you. And that's a real problem for those of us who work in the universities and colleges. Because we can just grind out our classes and our assignments and those kinds of things and have no idea that that time needs to be brought back into the life of God and redeemed or it will be lost. Ask yourself how much of your time really enters into the renewal and development of your life. How much of our time is spent doing things that we think, well, we just have to do. I have this assignment. I have to do it because it'll hurt my grade if I don't get it. That's failing to redeem the time. You redeem the time when you bring everything that you're living through back into the flow of God's purposes. And we've already seen that that concerns all goodness, all truth, all righteousness. And the challenge to you and me is to be active in bringing everything that fills our time back into God's time and make it count for him. And the, the great threat is that we will think we don't do that unless we're doing something religious. You know, uh, religion can be a very good thing, but it's never life. And redemption has to do with life. It has to do with our moments, our days, our relationships to other people, and the way we bring that before God and expect his blessing on it. Uh, you can go on to the next screen now. How do you redeem your time? We want to spend some time on that. And you redeem your time by making sure that your gentle but persistent focus is on all goodness and righteousness and truth. So now, let's think about that. What's your next assignment? Well, you know, 
Don't tell me. <laughs> I don't need to know. You know what your next assignment is. Maybe you have to read a book or you have to write a theme of some sort, whatever it may be. How do you redeem that? Uh, am I okay here? I mean, you understand we're talking about redeeming the things you're living through. And for us, that is largely academic work, social projects of various kinds. How do you redeem that? How do you do that? Well, let's be as concrete as possible. You start by being thankful. So your test that's coming over the hill, or your next paper that you have to write and get in, or your next interview with a professor or someone else, um, start by being thankful. Thank you, Lord, for this test. Can you say that? Uh, can we say that together? <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for this test. Thank you for this exam. Hmm? You know, in, a, in redeeming your life, you can't make much progress without being thankful. And being thankful is sort of right up front uh, in working with God, is being thankful. Now, this is going to take some effort. God will help you. But if you want to redeem your time and save your life, you start with being thankful for the next thing that's up front. Can I just close my eyes and give you a moment to think about that and be thankful? I say, be thankful for the next class, the next assignment. Did you do it? You know, redemption is a very concrete kind of thing. And one of the problems with religion is it becomes so abstract. But we don't live in abstractions. We live in events, in relationship with people. And to be thankful for that is to acknowledge that God is there. God is there. You say, I didn't even want to take this course. I got stuck with it because what I wanted was already filled or the, it's what it's, you know, something happened. I didn't want to take this course. I know what that's like. I wound up once with a course in parliamentary law. satisfied a requirement, but it sure didn't satisfy me. <laughs> you may be in that position, in a wonderful place like Westmont. I didn't want to take this course. So now take that step and be thankful for that course. Now that has to be combined sometimes with, I don't know why, but here I am and I know that you're here, and so I'm going to thank you for this, and then I'm going to look for your hand to bring to light the righteousness, goodness, and truth that is in this course. Now, the rule is, if you don't look for it, you won't find it. Was it there? Yeah, it could have been there. Probably was there. After all, God is running the show, right? He's running the show. So probably there's some good there. And if you start out by thanking God for it, you'll probably find it. So your next test, your next assignment. You see, salvation is here. It's always here. It's never there. God is in our moment. That's where we meet him and that's where we live with him. And we take our uh, assignments. Uh, or of course, there are lots of things outside of school for each of us. And we present those to God. And it's there that we experience his deliverance. Now, excuse me while I just hammer on this a moment. 
because we have real trouble bringing the wonderful words of the scripture and the Christian life down to where we are. So if we can go on to the next screen, I want to give you a little advice from Paul. Paul was a jailbird. It's said that he knew the inside of more jails than anyone else in the Roman Empire. And now here he is, he's writing to the Philippians from jail. And you know, those jails weren't nice. They didn't have TVs even. And uh, so you, you, you look at Paul and you see him rejoicing and uh, telling people how to live thankfully. And uh, he says, uh, in everything, give thanks, pray, lift yourself up to God. And right towards the end of this magnificent passage in Philippians, there's this famous verse where he says, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is, wait a minute, you say. What's this got to do with salvation? Now see, that's the problem that we have for spiritual formation. Is we have a version of salvation that doesn't concern spiritual formation. Spiritual formation, as I said, has to do with the kind of person we are becoming. And you say, well, I don't have to become that kind of person because I'm saved by grace. That means I don't have to do anything. Is that how that works? Well, if you're just waiting to die, I guess that's it. But if you have an interest in this life, there's a lot more to it. What is Paul telling you to do? Could we do that? Listen to it again. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, what is well regarded, if there's any virtue or anything to praise, keep your mind on these things. And you say, what about God? Aren't we supposed to keep our mind on God? That's where God is. That's where God is. Sometimes you read Paul in these words or, uh, or the words that uh, are in others of his writings and we think he's talking about something that doesn't concern us now. We're going to come to the fruit of the Spirit in a moment and talk about that love, joy, peace, and so on. See, if those are just abstractions, they will not affect your life. And you wind up hoping that someday the Holy Spirit's just going to pour it on you. It doesn't work that way. Fruit comes slowly. It comes out of the tree, out of the branch, out of the bud, out of the blossom. And then it hangs around for quite a while at the, on the branch there and it's good for nothing except to grow. See, all of that is concrete process. Would you like to be a person whose life is framed by love? Okay, find something around you and start loving it. You fill your life with God. We can go on to the next screen. You fill your life with God by constantly submitting where you are to love, to joy, to peace, and so on. That's how you focus on all of the things that are righteous and true and good as Ephesians. That's how you buy back your time. Because if you don't do it, the time will go by, it'll be lost, it'll not profit you, it'll not profit anyone else because you have not taken God into that moment. 
The world around you is set to waste your time. Did you know that? It's set up in a way to waste your time. And the main way that it does that is to convince you that what you're doing and what you're engaged in is not of great value. And so you wind up having to be distracted. And distraction is one of the main enemies of the human soul. And the human being winds up investing what time they have in stuff that doesn't matter. And when we begin to look around us at what we're doing, and you know, a place like this is just one of the most glorious places on earth. You get to study wonderful stuff. What could be better than that? Well, that's the question, isn't it? But if you come to look at where you are, the world around you is set to pull you away and waste your time. And you have to redeem your time by coming to look at everything you are involved in as under the hand of God. Now when you do that, then you can go back and be thankful for your test. Uh, are any of you willing to experiment with that? Try it. See, that's where life is lived. You live your life of spiritual formation and growth by experimenting with God on the things that you're going to have to live through anyway. So you don't waste your time. You redeem your time by filling your world with God. And then the outcome of that is the fruit of the Spirit. Let's move on to the next screen just for that one now. I hope all of you have memorized these. Right? I mean, there, there are many passages that you just need to memorize. So they'll be right there in front of your mind, present in your heart, and actually working in your body. If you want the Word of God to work in your body, memorize it. Because it is actually a substance and a power. And it works on its own if you just take it in. If you get a prescription from your doctor and you don't take it, it doesn't do you any good. Set it on the shelf. If you don't take the Word of God in, and especially these wonderful statements, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness. Now here, I hope you're thinking already, oh, he's not talking about an abstraction. You know, he's not talking about having a wonderful feeling of love. <laughs> you know. He's talking about loving things. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And he can help you love that test. See? Joy is not just kind of effervescent stuff. See, you have a lot of people who get addicted to joy. That is, they want the feeling. But joy is a condition of life. It has some feeling with it, but it can be there when you don't even have the feeling. If you go for the feeling, you'll fall into addiction. With love. Many people don't love, they love love. You know the song, falling in love with love? What a wonderful thing it is. Gives you goosebumps an inch high. You don't fall in love with love. It'll just mess up your life. And it does that to many, many, many people. And they're in love with love. And they get married on that basis. That's a short trip to disaster. Better love the person you're marrying, not love. It'll work much better if you do that. The fruit of the Spirit is concrete reality. Love, joy, peace. I'm at peace with you. I don't just have peace. I'm at peace with you. I'm at peace with those who are around me. Maybe they're my enemies, but I am at peace with them, even though they aren't at peace with me. 
Huh? That make any sense at all to you? God gives me peace, and I have peace with them. And then, you know, when you've gone that far, you find a, a lot of other things very easy. For example, patience. Now, if you try to be patient with someone, but you don't have love, joy, and peace, rots a ruck. It won't work. But if you have learned concretely to live in the fruit of the Spirit, by the presence of God in your life, by taking the events of daily life and turning them over to God and living in them, you're going to find patience is a walk in the park. Well, you see the whole fruit of the Spirit there. Um, let's just uh, go on to the last couple of frames here. What is the saved life? What is the saved life? It is a life devoted to beauty, truth, and goodness in the power of the risen and living Christ who is with you in all you do. Beauty, truth, and goodness are where God concretely dwells with us in our life. How much beauty is in, in your life? Well, actually, just living on this campus, you get a lot of it. Beauty is goodness made present to the senses. Beauty is goodness made present to the senses. Truth is a reflection of reality, including beauty and goodness. These three all go together. It enables us to seek and find what is good. And that's why Jesus said, if you're my disciples, you live in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Goodness. Well, goodness is all that nourishes and strengthens human life in a proper order. Strawberry ice cream cones are good, but you don't want to live for them. Do you? You know, if you, if you had to die, a good way might be to drown in a strawberry milkshake. <laughs> uh, something like that. But you don't want to live for that, right? So you have to have the goods in order. And you're looking for beauty, truth, and goodness as a servant of Christ. Now, let me just finally make this point. If your salvation does not include living with God in beauty, truth, and goodness, it's going to be a very dry haul. And so much of our difficulty today for Christians in this world, and for the world without a vital Christianity in its midst, so much of the problem comes from having a Christ who has no association with beauty, maybe not even truth, and not goodness. And so let me give you the last frame here to cap this off. A Christ without beauty, truth, and goodness is a testimony against the goodness of God, the grandeur of God. Your salvation includes these things. Jesus is the sponsor of them. He actually created them. You have to go to the cross, but you don't live there. You live in resurrection. Hmm? Am I making any sense at all? See, the cross is necessary, but you do not live there. You live in resurrection life with Jesus. The cross is there to cut off all of the things in our life that would keep us from the life of beauty, truth, and goodness. Beauty, truth, and goodness without Christ is a wretched, failing human substitute for the life we are meant to have. Okay. And it always, they always deflect and go sour and become harmful. 
So you watch a person who's trying to make beauty their religion and see how their life goes. It will not go well. Beauty, truth, and goodness, the substance of life in God, requires the presence of God, the Trinitarian God, to hold it together and to make it prosper.